Hello and welcome to our swine health seminar. My name is Marin McGuire and I'm a senior in animal science here at Purdue University. Um, first off, I'd like to thank our sponsor for the event tonight, JYGA Technologies, and they are the manufacturer of Just Stall. Our, one of our speakers tonight is Dr. Kara Stewart. She's an associate professor here at Purdue in repro physiology. She graduated with her PhD from North Carolina State University and joined the Purdue faculty here in animal science in 2013. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tom Gillespie. He is a board certified uh, swine veterinarian and he graduated from Purdue's vet school in 1979. And so I'll let you get started. Hi, good evening. Um, so today I was going to give a summary of some research that's been going on at Iowa State University. Um, so I want to first start out by describing the people that were involved in the research project, as it's not mine, I'm just telling you uh, what they found in their research projects. Um, so this was a large grant funded by the National Pork Board um, and then a big collaboration across all of the Iowa pork producers and their animal science department. Um, and their Pork Producer Association there. Uh, and so I want to thank Amanda Chipman and Jason Ross at Iowa State. Um, the slides I'm even using tonight are really their slides that they've been using to present a lot of their data. And so they were gracious enough to let me use their slides tonight to show what is in their final report from some years that they've been doing this research on uh, prolapses. And then I'll show you kind of what we have in a collaborative grant going forward for the next couple years and what we might see coming out. Um, okay, so a little bit of the background of why there was some interest in looking into sow uterine prolapses. Uh, mortality in the sows in the swine industry has been increasing over the past five years. And actually, if you do a simple Google search, you'll see that there is a ton of information out there and speculation as to why mortality has been slowly increasing in the sow population. Um, this is kind of a, a welfare, or not kind of, it is a welfare issue and uh, something that really needed to be addressed. So that's when the pork board kind of put together an RFP to request some re scientists to put together ideas for how we could start to address it. One thing that was noticed uh, a couple years ago was that the rates of uterine prolapses in sows around the time of farrowing was increasing at even a faster rate than the average mortality was. So this particular grant was put together to investigate just that portion of the mortality. So there was the recognition that the problem existed and then the folks at Iowa State decided to kind of start to um, put together a proposal where they were going to monitor and benchmark uh, how often the prolapses were occurring and then they were going to identify the putative causes. So this grant is basically going to only cover these two areas and then they have some ideas for the future of how they can start to create mitigation strategies to see if they can reduce the prolapse rates. Um, but this, their first initial studies were basically just to identify what could be some of the factors that might be contributing to this increase in, in prolapse rate and get some ideas for research that could be developed. So they first worked to establish a network of industry partners. So they started contacting sow farms all across the United States. Um, they developed a survey tool uh, to try to gather data, very specific data from all these different farms. And then they established a big communication and advisory network of producers. So part of the real benefit of this um, research project was the network of people that started communicating with each other to, to kind of share information across genetics companies, across state lines, across the US here. We had a lot of good communication. Um, and then they started to actually start to collect all kinds of data samples and, and take all kinds of samples from the sows. Um, so we're hoping that the study, that the data that they gathered would be able to be used to design research trials in the future, and I'll show some of those. Um, so there were 104 sow farms across the U.S. that were enrolled in the study, um, and they had to provide data about general mortality as well as very specific data about their prolapse rates and other management things that go on on their farm for 52 straight weeks. So it started, I believe, in February and went a full year uh, with data collection. 
Um, so there were 85 kind of larger production systems and then 19 independent farms and it represented um, farms ranging from 600 sows up to the largest which was 10,600 sows. So we had, they had quite a good range in small and large farms um, and the total was 386,000 sows represented in their data set. Uh, they were also very specific that they wanted farms that had a prolapsing problem or had seen an increase in prolapse rates as well as farms that had not so that we could start to really see what was differentiating between those those farms. So the data that they collected from these surveys of all these farms, I'm not going to read through all of these, but everything from uh, management, diets, mycotoxin binder ingredients, um, if they did AI hygiene and how the practice was in pulling pigs and performing AI, um, perienal region score, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, but tail docking length, body condition scoring of sows. Uh, so they really did gather a ton of information as well as they started to gather feed samples from every individual farm and bank those for later analyses. So this is just a, a graph of this is all of those 104 farms across the bottom and this is what their uh, prolapse rate was. So you can see that they did have some farms here on the tail end um, that did not have a very high prolapse rate. And then those uh, over here on the high end with the highest farm having almost a 10% uh, uterine prolapse rate. When you look at their overall mortality and their prolapse mortality together, so I know it can be hard to see a little bit here, but the um, the prolapse only mortality is in the yellow and then the non-prolapse mortality is in the red. So you can see there's a lot of variation among the farms at what percentage of their overall mortality. So for example this farm here had a lot of their mortality was from the prolapses whereas this farm that had a pretty high overall mortality rate only a small percentage of that was from the prolapses. So there was a lot of variation in total mort mortality as well as mortality directly from the prolapses. Um, if we take together all of the reasons for mortality from these farms put together, um, we really did make, they made the farms be very specific in their data collection about whether it was a rectal prolapse or a vaginal uterine prolapse or a combination of both. And so when you put anal and vaginal rectal together, um, it was accounting for 21% of the mortality was coming from uterine or anal prolapses together. So you can see there's definitely a need to start investigating why these rates were getting high. Uh, this looked at the annual uh, total mortality across the year that was um, looked at again from February 2018 until January of 2019. So you can see there's a lot of variation in, in mortality um, and the highest, uh, the orange here is the lowest um, farms that have the lowest incidence of uterine prolapse and the yellow there is the highest with the average being in the middle. And this was total mortality so you can see how it seems kind of consistent across the year that the farms just have a kind of consistent mortality. When you look at this with just the mortality coming from the prolapses, um, you can see that the average and the lowest get a little bit closer together, so a lot more of the variation in mortality among the farms is coming from the prolapse rate, how many prolapses they have. Um, I think you could almost start to see a little bit of maybe a seasonal effect in there where you kind of see it goes down, prolapses go down a little bit here maybe in the middle of the summer and then back up again in the December, January. Um, not sure that that's a real thing, but you could almost start to see that a little bit. Okay, so what they did was um, try to come up with what they're going to call like stoplight red, yellow, and green. So factors in red that definitely were not associated with having uterine prolapses. There does not seem to be a relationship there. Um, other factors are in their yellow category, so that was there's moderate evidence or maybe we need to gather some more information to see if that's really a factor. And then things that definitely warrant some further in, in investigation in that green category that are definitely seem to be correlated with, with the prolapses. So I'm going to go through their results and kind of go through them in, the, in that order if I can, the red, yellow, and then the green and, and what we're kind of pursuing with them in the future. Um, so 
one pe thought was that farm size would be correlated with prolapse rate, and that was not found to be true. So um, when we said we had those farm inventories that went everywhere from 600 up to 10,000, we don't see any correlation between uterine prolapse rate and, and farm size. Um, looking at management strategies, so one was looking at if they actually induce sows to farrow. Um, and so again, this is a red category, so there didn't appear to be any relationship between whether they induce or and uterine prolapse rate. And we had some farms that induced everyone, so the whole farm, you know, induced every sow that comes into farrow. And then we had some that also um, were sleeved versus multiple sleeving. So we broke down their, they broke down their management practices even from there. Um, and I would have guessed when I, if I was an educated guess in the beginning, I would have thought that perhaps uh, constant entering and pulling pigs from the sow would contribute possibly to prolapse, and that was not seeming to be true here. So uh, multiple sleevings was um, usually sleeved three or more times and those that were never sleeved, and we don't see any difference in uterine prolapse rates based on those management practices either. Um, litter size, so again, as you can imagine, the prolapse group um, did have a little bit of a lower live born, uh, but that usually could be expected because when they prolapse, there can be some piglets that get stuck in there in that process, and we may not get them out alive. Um, and so there was a little bit of a lower number of, of born there, but uh, we don't really think that is, or they don't really think that that is a causative factor. Litter size was not a causative factor of prolapsing. So it wasn't something like sows that had these really high litters um, and had to push out a lot more pigs ended up prolapsing. Stillborn rate, again, I think it would be expected that the stillborn rate would be higher in the prolapse sows because we may not be able to get those pigs out in time. Um, so we, they did see that in the data set, but again, not a causative factor of the prolapsing. Uh, so interestingly, they did look at sow housing type, so during gestation, um, looking at housing type and, and groups uh, pens versus stalls during gestation. Um, so there did have a correlation between being gestated in a pen had a higher incidence rate of uterine prolapse compared to a stall. Um, but there's a lot of other questions that remain in determining if this is a real causative factor. And a lot of that is, is that the farms in the, in the study have tons of variation in the number of sows that they have in each pen, the feeder types and styles and frequency that they have going on in there, when they're moved into the pens relative to breeding, if they're bred and moved directly into the pens, or if they're preg checked in a stall and then moved into the pens. So there's still a whole lot of variation there in the data that would need to probably be teased out to see if this has any sort of a causative factor. The other thing that's interesting about that, which maybe is expected a little bit, is that the overall total mortality is also higher from the sows that gestated in the pens um, as compared to the stalls. So uh, still some work probably to be done in that area to determine if those are causative factors. So I'm heading into the green category here. So these are things that definitely warrant some further investigation and had some really strong correlations with, with prolapse rate. Um, and so one was the gilt size at breeding. So they went in and they actually took uh, flank to flank measurements on all of the gilts uh, at breeding to determine their body size and made some conversions to body weight. Um, and if you look at the um, incidence of uterine prolapse and the larger the gilt was at breeding, the larger she was at breeding, the lower the incidence of prolapse was. So some of those smaller, lighter weight gilts had a higher incidence of prolapsing in their first parity. Uh, antibiotic usage, um, so they looked at antibiotics in the feed and looked at antibiotics in the feed with prolapse incidence and total mortality. So antibiotics in the feed did not have an effect on prolapse mortality, but it was actually contributing to a reduction in overall mortality to have antibiotics in the feed. I think they looked at, this was the other thing they looked at, is when the actual pulses of the antibiotics were going through the feed. 
um, and they looked at the prolapse incidence before a pulse of antibiotics, during a pulse of antibiotics, and after a pulse of antibiotics. Um, and so what you can see there is that before and during the pulse was um, about the same, but during the pulse there is a slight reduction in the prolapse rate while antibiotics are in the feed. Uh, so feed type and prolapse incidence, so this was also significant. So there seemed to be a higher rate of prolapse um, with pelleted feed over meal. Um, and so this also looked at gestation diet particle size and lactation diet particle size. Um, and so again, not a super strong correlation on some of these, but uh, a little bit of a correlation with diet particle size and the type of feed that's being fed lactation and gestation. So this one was a pretty strong correlation. So Dr. Gillespie is speaking next, and he's probably a person who's been talking to me about water quality for several years now. Um, and this was an interesting finding that they looked at whether the water on the farms was treated or not treated water. And so when you take it together, just not treated and treatment, there was a significant reduction in prolapse rate on farms that treated their water. And it didn't matter if they used the chlorine, chloride, chlorine dioxide tr water treatments or the other peroxide water treatments, treating the water in general reduced the prolapse rate on the farms. Uh, so this is kind of similar, but looking at the water source and then the treatment and the, and the uterine prolapse rate. Um, so an untreated well uh, had a pretty high prolapse rate, and that basically the rural water, maybe you could see is a little bit cleaner, a treated well and a treated pond. So no matter what, treating the water as it comes into the farm significantly reduced the uterine prolapse rate. Um, so then they went into the sows during gestation and looked at body condition score during gestation as a risk factor for prolapsing rate. Um, so this was also pretty interesting, but obviously the really thin sows had a much higher rate of uterine prolapsing when they moved into the farrowing barn compared to those that were uh, in a body condition score of three. Um, so that's uh, something that basically I think is a good indicator that we really need to be monitoring body condition score in gestation in general, but the, this is definitely a risk factor for prolapsing. So then they looked at bump feeding as a management practice, so whether um, bump feeding sows uh, could impact overall mortality as well as prolapse mortality. Um, so there was a little bit of a tendency for animals um, for all animals who were bump fed to have a little bit of a lower mortality, um, but it definitely did impact the prolapse rates. So animals that were bump fed, all animals or only bump feeding animals that had a low body condition score, um, that reduced the overall prolapse rate as well. So that kind of comes into the same thing about feed intake prior to farrowing. Um, so any sows that were eating less than five pounds of feed prior to farrowing, they had a higher incidence rate of uterine prolapse than those that were feeding more than five pounds, which is kind of similar to the thoughts on the bump feeding uh, at the end of gestation and early, right before they farrow, uh, early getting into lactation. So that was a, a contributor to reducing prolapse rate there. So what they also noticed on these farms was that there are sows that were more likely to prolapse, um, basically had this massive swelling of their perineal region. So the area between the rectum and the vulva would swell quite a bit in gestation and late gestation. So they came up with a simple scoring system, a one, two, or three. So one being where the, um, there's really no swelling or minimal swelling there between the rectum and the vulva. A two where you start to see some good protrusion here. I think that's a really nice picture. You really have to look at the sows when they're laying down to get these scores. And then a three where they have a pretty high risk of prolapse where you can already start to see um, some of the vaginal or anal tissue actually starting to prolapse even as early in gestation. So they went on to these farms and they trained a lot of the employees, um, but they also had 
trained people come into the farms. There was only four people, I think, that went in and started to do the measurements um, in gestation to, to score. And then we really see that the higher that perineal score is, the more likely they were to suffer from a uterine prolapse. Um, so again, if you look at the actual prolapse rates for the different uh, perineal scores, so ones only had about a 1% chance of prolapsing, and it went up to a 7% chance if they scored a 3. So the kind of hypothesis at the moment is why would these scores be important? And basically the question is what is changing in those sows in gestation that is setting them up for this high risk of uterine prolapse. Um, and so this is definitely an early indicator of sows that are at risk. So I think we can identify this as a tool that we can somehow use to identify our high risk sows. Um, and now we need to start I, I, you know, designing some experiments that we can go in and make some changes or do some mitigation strategies or do some further investigation into what is making these sows different. So if I kind of summarize what they found so far, um, things that appeared to not be correlated with uterine prolapsing is the size of the farm, the induction protocols that were used, assistance during farrowing, tail length, hygiene, and, and really that feed particle size was not strongly correlated. Um, some things that probably still need a little bit more investigation, we talked about the sow housing, a little bit more into health status and disease, genetics and the different genetic makeups of these different farms still needs to be brought into there. Um, they do have some data in their final report looking at laxatives and mycotoxins and some binders in the feed that are areas in the yellow category that may need a little bit more investigation. Um, Iowa State is now going to focus on uh, these green categories. So they are um, actually working with a water treatment company to go into the high prolapse incidence farms and install water treatment systems into those farms and see if the prolapse rate goes down. So that data, um, I'm pretty sure as of last week, um, almost all of the farms had their or were having their water treatment systems put in last week. Um, they're also going to do some work looking at body condition and some of the bump feeding strategies and definitely go down some of this perineal scoring and start to look at that. So this is as far as that first grant really took them, which was to just identify the areas that would be causative, potential causative factors and things to start doing some research in. And so the, the next phase for them was um, there was another RFP that came out from the National Pork Board that was looking at overall mortality as well. And so um, I'm a part of this as well as some folks at Kansas State. And this is what we call the survivability project. And so Iowa State's role is to continue looking at the mitigation strategies that from the causative factors identified in that first grant. And they're going to use this, met, this money now to test and validate some hypotheses and do some more studies and look at mitigation strategies, as well as work on a lot of dissemination of the information that they have gathered so far. So specifically, um, the perineal scores, the water treatment, body condition, antibiotic use, and genetics. That is what they have in this second grant to, to really start to investigate. Um, so they have a little bit of data already starting to come out of this second grant. Um, one is looking at the changes in those perineal scores over time. So looking at how early are those changes happening in that region of the sow and how early could we identify them as high risk sows for prolapse. Um, so you can see that it, the perineal score threes really don't start to show up until about week 15 of gestation. Um, and so you can see that the ones kind of go down as the twos and threes start to come up. So it is definitely later in gestation that we would be able to differentiate um, these sows that could be high risk. Um, if you look within each category, so if you look within the sows that score a perineal score of two or three, um, so 40 and 39 percent of the sows that score in those numbers will prolapse. So I think you know, you're, you're almost close to 50% of the animals that score in that high category are going to prolapse. And even just the twos, you get 40% of the twos are also going to be at risk for prolapsing. So um, being able to identify them early, the twos we can start to actually identify pretty early and they may eventually become a three. 
um, but we could identify those twos earlier um, in the process probably, or even in gestation. Uh, the other thing they're looking at is they went in and they took um, vaginal swabs or kind of samples of the microbiome of the vagina of the sows that had a perineal score of a three and those that were one. And then they waited to see if they actually prolapsed. So then they took the vaginal microbiome samples from the threes that prolapsed and a parity matched one that didn't prolapse. And they went in to look at the microbiome of their vagina to see if there is some differences. And the reason for this is that in humans, the leading cause of uterine prolapse in women is sexually transmitted diseases usually caused by a bacteria. And so they thought maybe the same thing was here that we just had the, some STD basically in our sows that was causing the, the prolapses. Um, so they wanted to see if there was a relationship between that perineal score and the vaginal microbiome. And it turns out that there is, and this is just some preliminary data from them, but if you've ever looked at a heat map, um, when you look at the top of a heat map, if your treatments, which are perineal score one in yellow and perineal score three in red, if your treatments tend to kind of cluster together, then they are different from each other. So you can see that the perineal score threes, the majority of them do have a bunch of different um, bacteria which are kind of turning out to be the red versus the almost all blue patterns over here in the perineal score ones. Um, so there's a lot of work that they're putting into this project to see if there is some sort of an identifiable difference that we could um, use to tell whether they were going to prolapse or not. So that's one of their big projects. Um, the other big project is that water treatment project. And again, the water treatment um, things are just being put into the farm. So there'll be a lot more to come in the near future for, for that. Um, so this new grant now is uh, funding between the FFAR and pork checkoff money. And then again, Purdue here, K-State and Iowa State are working on this. All of the information from their first study or first kind of grant results, as well as all the new data as it comes out, will be available at piglivability.org. And so that's going to be the website that has basically all of the information coming together. And it's going to be all of the information from K-State and Purdue, as well as Iowa State following on the prolapse projects. But we're working across all phases of production to reduce mortality in this, in this grant. And so there'll be all the information from all of those projects will be up there. Um, a lot of this is now coming out as extension fact sheets and short, uh, less than 10 minute video clips that will also go through all of the results of the uterine prolapse. So I kind of picked and chose what I wanted to show you today, um, but their entire final report is available and it's on the website as well as downloadable information fact sheets. And Amanda Chipman has been working to put together these awesome little 10 minute clip videos that kind of describe one topic at a time or one risk factor at a time for uterine prolapsing. So there's some really good information up there. Um, you can also download um, anything directly from there and specifically on this pelvic organ prolapse, you can get the whole final report there. You can also go onto the website and subscribe for the list and sign up to get email updates for any new information and the latest data that is coming out of this grant. It'll be available and you'll be getting emails. And then just to put a little plug in, since I'm part of this grant as well, um, we're gonna have our first pig survivability conference coming up October 28th and 29th in 2020 in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and so we're going to be hopefully pulling together a lot of industry partners as well as academics um, to get together and really talk about improving pig survivability. Um, so it will be limited to about the first four or 500 people that can make it, but I'd like you to put that on your radar for the future and hope that you can make it to come talk about our survivability in pigs. And that's all I have for you today. Take any questions? On the guilt mortality issue, did they tease out if she, if she'd had an estrous cycle, like a heat no estrus or a heat no serve, what level of sexual maturity was in the younger group or that lighter group? 
I don't think they have that information. So for the body condition, for the testing, that was just a small group of them, and that was at the time of breeding. So that was when they were in the sow farm already, I think, not in the GDU and looking at heat no services and all that. So um, I'm not sure how many different strategies there are in the farms that they sampled for that in terms of do they have a documented heat no service before they make it into the breeding row to get bred or, or not. So I don't know that answer. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Um, I had one question regarding the perineal scoring, where you identify them as a score of one, two, or three. Once you identify that a sow has, say, a score of, of two or three, what are strategies that you might take to maybe prevent her from prolapsing, or is it just bound and determined to happen? So it's still only going to be about 40% of those that become a two or three that will prolapse, so there's still 60% of them that don't. Um, so that's the next step of these research trials is what is the difference between those animals and the ones that don't or the ones that get to a perineal score of three but still don't prolapse and seem to do fine so that's what the next phase is is that we've identified that this swelling seems to be an identifiable kind of risk factor but then even within that group 60 percent of those still don't prolapse so what is the difference so that's why they're looking at the the bacteria you know microbiome of the vagina and a few other ideas of hypotheses that'll be starting up in the next few years. So if you have any thoughts, you should share. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Uh, were they able to identify which parity has the higher risk compared to a lower risk? The number of parturition has a risk or? I'm pretty sure that the parity was not a risk factor, but the body condition score was. So regardless of parity, the, small, the lower body condition scores always had a higher risk compared to the higher, but it wasn't associated with parity, if I'm not mistaken. That's a good question. Okay, thanks. By Dr. Stewart is getting me set up. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Tom Gillespie. Practiced uh, now about 40 years, so a little bit of gray hair coming here tonight. And we're going to look at sow mortality in a bigger scope. So Dr. Stewart talked to us about the POP study, and that's fascinating um, information. We're going to look across and we're going to help answer this question on parity. Um, but you know, biosecurity is where our industry is headed. And I got to wonder if treating the water, no matter the source, is somehow reducing transmission across the site. I've seen it with PERS, um, possibly the water. And again, we need to tease out a lot of things. Was the water being delivered by nipples? was or a trough or a combination, you know, so that might help us understand treating the water a little bit as well. So for those of you that are thinking about that aspect. So as we get into this, this as well is a large database. And you can see at the top, we're looking at years 2015, 16, 17. We're in the process of gathering 18 and 19 but it's gonna be a few months before we'll be able to add that to, this, to the trends that we're gonna look at here tonight. We got roughly 600,000 sows. <clears throat> you can see on the second line, 2015 all the way over to 2017, over, a little over 600,000 sows. But the death rate is continuing to increase. 
in those three years. As you drop down, I think one of the outstanding features in this particular slide is the number of sows that we're losing in the industry. Now, there's, I'll show you a slide in a little bit of the databases. There's 13 databases that go into this. There's multiple farms in some, single farms in others. And you can see some of the other trends there on this slide. <clears throat> uh, you know, if you want to look at percent depth of removals, anyway, it's increasing and it's, it's an issue that we need to take a look at pretty seriously. This slide shows the 13 different databases and the number of sows in the databases. <clears throat> Those numbers aren't very large, so I don't know if you can see them that well. This, this next slide is an attempt to show that one database is not um, causing it causing the data to be skewed one way or the other. So we do have one database in the center, database six, that has a large number of sows, and you can see that from this graph. And of course, correspondingly, they also had a lot of mortality. But again, in these two charts, you can see the trend over the three years. And again, it's too high, number one, and and it's increasing in most of the databases over the three years. <clears throat> if you want to look at total sows removed, this kind of also looks at our industry a bit. See if I can do this. If you look at uh, total calls and, and removes, they're the bottom line. Not too much difference between 2015 and 2016, but we had quite a jump. In 2017, you can see that in that column chart as well. So we were adding a lot of females starting in that 2016 right into 2017. And when we look at the parity distribution, you can see that timeline a little bit as well. This is total born over the 13 databases. And by the way, this takes farms from the western Corn Belt all the way to the southeast part of the United States. So geographically it's crossed a large area. <clears throat> but you can see we have all talked about and we've seen articles on how the total born has increased and we're doing a really really nice job with this sow. But I gotta wonder if that's not one of our risk factors, this modern sow, and how are we taking care of her? I think that's something we have to tease out as we go forward. <clears throat> but across nearly all those databases, you're seeing a nice increase in total born. Took a look at the total deaths by reason. This was a challenge. The challenge is our industry needs to standardize causes of death. So we had to group deaths into the, the list of reasons you see along the side of the, of the slide. And so then the pie graph just tells us, you know, where things are happening. So for instance, 19% of the total deaths is due to lameness. And you might think why that's the case. Sure, housing can be a part of it, but a lot of it comes back to the lower feet the structure of the foot, main, maintaining a decent toe length, so trimming toes, things like that, depends on how they wear those toes. If, if the gilts were left too long on a plastic flooring in the nursery, in my opinion, that's a risk factor of having longer toes later. And then I want you to think about how we pin those animals in the finisher. And if we had large pins, I mean, these were 200 head per pin, the toe length seemed to be a little longer as they aged as well. So I don't know where that's gonna lead. That's just testimonials from my observations and practice. But lameness is huge. It's, it's big for the, for the sow mortality, 
and euthanasia aspects, but it's also big on the calling aspects as well. We're going to dig into the health uh, pie part there in a little bit, in a, in a little later slide. This is one of the take-home slides. We are losing way too many P0s, P1s, P2s in our sow herds. It's phenomenal information for me. Until you do this kind of meta-analysis approach, you don't realize the scope. You look at parity distributions in systems, you look at parity distributions across individual farms, you don't always get this same feel. This to me was one of the aha moments of putting this, and this was a fun project, by the way, and I should have said this earlier, PigChamp provided the data and helped pull this thing together. It's not something that's easy to do. So uh, Jane Jackson, for instance, and her team up there at PigChamp needs a lot of credit for helping pull this together. But anyway, back to this parity distribution thing. I think this is a take home message that we need to look at our young gilts and make it a priority. Try to keep these girls in the, in the herd a little bit longer. Try to understand this. So total deaths by parity, similar to the last graph. Some people like to see pie graphs. I tend to like the bar graphs, but this, is, this says the same thing. Month, you might ask about seasonality. There's two seasons here. There's a disease season, that's PERS. Now, not the typical October, November, December, January time period. This was more in the spring. And this is where one, I'm sorry, maybe two of the databases are influencing the information. They're the ones that broke with PERS at a screaming mortality in, the, in that month of April. So that's why we see that one year with such a high mortality. This is an area that Purdue's working on. Alan Schinkel and Scott and the rest of you guys are all working on this. We see this every year. Environmentally, we're not controlling the environment well enough for these sows. So I'm excited about what they find here with their cooling pads and so forth. And the reason I say that, it's not, and I'm gonna show you in a minute where the other aha moment is with, uh, with sow mortality. So if you wanna look at it again in a pie chart, this is the pie chart, shows you similar things to what we've already looked at. Now, when it comes to prolapsing, this reflects our need to be able to document things better on these units so that we can compare across farms and across systems. So we basically, when I look at a chart like this, and we don't have very many rectal or uterine prolapses or vaginal prolapses, basically the, the employees are telling me they're just calling it a prolapse. To them, it was a prolapse. It was not something they wanted. And, and how frustrating is it to an employee to work their tail off on a gilt? And I've seen this happen more than once. Beautiful gilt litter. She's in great body condition. They kept, they fed her well. They wean her that afternoon. And when I'm going through my herd visit the next morning, she's standing there with her rectum hanging out about like this and still eating. So I think there's things that were missing. Dr. Stewart did a really, really good job of framing that up for us to think about. But I think there's something that we're missing with this modern sow. And I think it's very complicated. This is the other take home slide, in my opinion. Where are sows dying? Right around Fairway. And during the, and then afterwards. So I asked several of my clients, you know, when I was still in practice, and they said, oh yeah, sows die around Fairway. They already knew that from the standpoint they're pulling them out. But when you look at this many sows over 
three years, that's a pretty, pretty good chart. And it just shows you by numbers there in the bottom where we need to focus some attention, I think. But again, I want to put in the next two years and see if these trends continue. This is a very busy slide, um, but it also looks at the day of death since service. This was the other, the other way that we wanted to look at this, not by parity or so forth, but we wanted to standardize. And one of the hard facts in record production record system is the day you service the sow. So first service. And then what happens in her life after that? And this is just the raw data that went into that previous slide. And again, this is the parity. As we tease out the parities, well, of course, the younger parity sows, there's more of them in a herd. Well, they're going to be, the, they're going to have the highest chance of, of, of dying. So and that's what basically this slide is showing, you know, from these older parity sows to the younger parity sows. So it's intuitive once you start to look at this kind of information and then think about it on a parity basis. And then weaning, it two or three days after weaning, sow mortality is back down. But we do have a little blip there around weaning. So again, we, there's probably things we can do um, there that, or at least think about that we need to be doing. And I know that was very quick, but I wanted to just give a broad picture of what we know today in those three production years. So, sow mortality is real. It's a concern. We need to do more than just talk about it. And I think this is the beginning. Having more research put into it, more people looking at it, we're going to come up with better ideas on how to take care of things. The problem is big. How do you climb a mountain this big? One step at a time. And that's what we're doing like with these talks tonight, just making people more aware of where things are, what we can be doing. One has to wonder, when you get a little long in the tooth, about things that I've listed here. You know, inducing, is that a problem? I don't think it is, if it's done correctly, if it's not too early. We, we've induced from 112 to 114 days of just, of, yeah, of gestation to um, get those sows to farrow early because that was what was good for us. That was years ago. Now we've moved that to where it's more of a tool and we pinpoint the sows that we want to induce. I don't see inducing as a concern. I don't see a large litters as a concern. Kara said the same thing. Environmental challenges are there. Individual farm issues are there. I think we can do a lot with training of our staff to be alert to maybe finding these sows in a crisis mode a little quicker. By the way, that's where technology is going to go for us and it's going to go very quickly. Think about a Fitbit for a sow. Okay? Monitor her temperature, her respiratory rate, everything, heart rates, and be able to know sooner when she's probably, probably in a crisis than we do today. We rely on observation. We rely on a thermometer if a farm has one. They're cheap. They should have several. They should be temping every sow the day after farrowing, in my opinion. But that's hard to get into a system or even a farm that's a little bit short on labor. So you see some of the struggles we have, but it's not an excuse. We need to be better at what we're doing. And I think that just comes back. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to train the individuals that we have and see if we can't make them better. And the question that I'd like to leave the audience with tonight, are we feeding this modern sow the best that we can? And I'm not putting anything more on nutrition, but you talk about oxidative stress, you talk about inflammation, you know, how do we get a handle on this? Maybe we need more chelated minerals. I'm totally out of my comfort zone now when I talk about nutrition, but I gotta wonder 
if we are providing her with the nutrients at the right time, I don't know. Dr. Stewart kind of mentioned that as well. But there is a need in our industry to standardize reasons of death just so that we can compare. I went through that pretty quickly, but I am very eager for any and all questions. Thank you. Okay. So I'm intrigued by the post bleeding problem. Is there some things we can do to achieve? I've seen in farms or people are trying. You know, my first thought is we need to back off food the day before weaning, maybe. Is that part of it? I don't know. What do you think the cause we can do for that first day after weaning? Dr. Record, you. You have uh, inadvertently stepped into one of my passion areas, and that is we don't know, we guess. And until we start to necropsy sows, we're not going to know exactly, or maybe we can't even then know exactly the cause of death, but we can get a lot closer the more sows we necropsy. For instance, we've had gastric torsions, twisting of the intestines, just sporadically on farms, and we might lose two or three in a, in a course of a few days, and then we don't lose them for a while. But until you necropsy that sow, you're not really going to know for sure if she died of a gastric ulcer. Well, sometimes you should with a gastric ulcer, they'll turn pale or twisted gut or whatever, which comes back to your point how to feed the sow. So we've played around with that in practice a lot. There's very, very few farms that can put that sow in the farrying crate on 112, 113th day and give her full feed and let her adjust the feed, the amount she's going to eat right through farrowing and right on. And what we found on, on a couple of those farms is they'll, they'll go from gestation and they'll eat 10, 12 pounds that first day. And then they'll back down to about six, somewhere in that six range, five and a half, seven. And they'll just maintain that until they get into about day three post farrowing and then we're pouring the coals to them as much as they'll eat. Ad lib is the best, in my opinion. But again, that means changing the feed, feeder type sometimes, how you're going to feed, how many times a day you feed. I think that's an issue as well. Feeding twice a day in farrowing may not be enough for this sow. We may need to be up to four times a day. Smaller amounts, more frequent, maybe more than four, I'm not sure. I think that's a wide open area that we need to look at with this sow. Very, very good question. Uh, so you started talking about water quality, uh, Dr. Stewart as well. So what would be some of the reasons that the water quality, it might end up with the sow mortality, like physiolo physiological reasons or is that due intake or minerals, you know? First, we need to monitor how much water sows are drinking especially in gestation. We had one farm in practice where we were monitoring for years. We tried everything. We tried, and even treating the water didn't change the amount. So a sow that's got an individual bull, we know will drink five and a half gallons of water a day, year in, year out. And that's with an individual bull. That's not a trough. So we, we can monitor those sows better with that. 
dropping the feed into that bowl. She drinks that water to get to the feed. So in, in lactation, gestation, we, we, knew, we knew how much water the, that sow would drink in gestation. So that's five, five and a half gallons. We had a farm that at best would only drink three gallons a day. We learned how to manage that sow in that situation. So that's your farm uniqueness. Each farm has got some unique issues. And it was a water quality issue we chased for years. We had several experts in. Nobody could quite get it right to improve it. We made the water better. We treated for sulfur. We treated for other things. We filtered. We did all kinds of things to get that water better. We never could. So the sow's telling us something. She didn't like the water. We couldn't identify it through lab test, through anything that we tried to do. So there's part of that water quality issue that needs to be looked at. But I think we need to be monitoring how much water is disappearing. Either they're drinking it or it's in the trough or whatever. Good question. And do people know that they can send questions in, Dr. Brian? Okay. You showed that, of course, the, there's a higher number of P1s because there's more P1s because of the parity distribution. And have you ever done a plot like that, but done it death loss per thousand animals? No, but that's what needs to be done. So you You're absolutely right, Alan. So the question for those that couldn't quite hear it, we're going back to the slide on the parity distribution. Whoops, this one. And what we need to do to really clarify this is to look at death loss by 1,000 head. So that <coughs> standardizes, and you can look across farms that way with sow mortality. You can, you can look at the parity the, the same way. Very, very good question. But, but there's no doubt the cost of losing a, a gilt or a P1 that you put so much money into bringing into your herd is the most expensive because. Absolutely. Eric, look at the death loss in P0s. We haven't even got a litter out of them. And the cost of taking them from market weight to that time is expensive. Correct. And there's a whole area out here that we need to look at on health of these of these gilts, monitoring them. There, but go ahead, Alan, you had another question? I have another question. I don't, it may be hard to answer, but with this death loss going up, could it possibly be related to to less antibiotic use in some way? So again, the question is, with the increasing death loss to th all these years, does it relate to less antibiotic use possible? I think before we can ever go there, we have to really better understand why these sows are dying. I'm fascinated with the POP project looking at vaginal, micro, the, the vaginal bacterial fungal type um, populations, you know, and how water treatment might do that. That's, you know, to me, that's internal biosecurity control. Are we influencing things that way? What's the gut health like? I mean, gut health is this huge bucket everybody throws things in but uh, what can we be doing it's a little bit of brian's question on how to feed these sows is the bumping helping us everybody in the world has endorsed the skinny sow program what i mean by that is we used to have very today in our standards very heavy sows we thought they were normal but what we found is that if we could make her a little thinner in gestation, 
like a marathon runner, she would eat better in lactation and would have bigger pigs at 21 days. So feed in makes milk. Pigs need that milk. They pull that milk out. The more milk she has, the better they grow. So that's the game that we're playing, but we're making this sow run this marathon very quickly. And that's where I'm coming from. Are we providing her with everything that she needs? I don't know. And we got more pigs to take care of. You got another question, Alan? If you have farms that skip heat after their first litter or maybe they failed to breed, is there any information that if you give the sow a kind of a month off, you know, 21 days off, that it changes that any? Very good question. Basically the question again is if we move to batch farrowing, if we could tease out the sows that, you know, didn't quite fit into the perfect batch, might have skipped an estrus, or we had to skip an estrus, or we manipulated her reproductive cycle a little bit with product to get her more time to heal. We'd have to tease that out of this. I don't know that we have that recorded well enough in this kind of a data set. The other thing I need to say is that there's all kinds of genetics in this database. So we didn't even touch on genetics. It's interesting, you go around, I get the opportunity to visit other places besides the United States. And we don't see this kind of mortality in other areas of the world. especially in the Asian countries. Granted, they're not having as many pigs yet. They're just now changing and they're rapidly changing from the old 70, 80 style sow that we had to the sow that we have today. So their learning curve is gonna be pretty steep. But um, we don't see this kind of mortality there yet. Not as an industry anyway. Like the factors that you're um, looking at here, are those factors able to be mirrored in the growing and finishing swine populations that you're looking at? I think that's an excellent question. Uh, it's a whole different set of um, stresses, set of health issues in the grow finish populations today. Uh, mortality there is pretty heavily influenced by the pathogens. So a PERS, PRDC kind of combination, mycoplasma, PERS, influenza would be the big three. You throw a little bit of uh, salmonella ileitis in on that or something else that might be unique to that flow and your mortality is going to be higher. But I think that's a different set of concerns than what we're looking at here. But, a, but something that we still need to look at, I still need to monitor. Scott's got a question. And this is probably a wide open question, maybe one that Kara could have addressed, I don't know. But I, has anybody looked at vaginal pH? Because I was just, does water intake or water quality at all affect vaginal pH? Or I would think that would affect the microbiome. I guess you could make the opposite argument as well, but it seems like that might be an easy thing to look at. We have looked at urine pH because there's, again, we had a, um, we had a bacteria, and I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of it right now, Eubacterium suis, I think it was, that caused horrendous sow death loss there in the 90s. It's still present. The bacteria is still present in some herds, but it's not causing the sow mortality today. But to look at <clears throat> sows, if they're catabolic or whatever, 
We've taken the test strips and we've tried that, but not the vaginal. Ask the pH of the vaginal fluids that we haven't, I haven't, and I don't know if anybody has. So I like your idea, Scott, from the standpoint that would be a non-invasive type of way of trying to understand, you know, what's going on with that sow or that sow herd. I'm going to back up a little bit to, sure. the, the la to Dr. Stewart's segment. Um, was, and maybe I missed it, was perineal score correlated with water quality as well? Oh, I wish she was here to answer that. Uh, I don't know. So the question again is perineal score related to water, uh, correlated with water quality? Right. Do you guys remember yeah, if she had a... Do you see an increase in perineal scores with the lower water, water quality, essentially? I don't remember a slide on that. The, the other thing that I would be curious about is to see, you know, on those farms that struggle with prolapsing um, more than others, you know, are, are nutritional strategies being used like laxatives um, and what would be the difference between the farms using laxatives within their diets and not and how that relates to prolapsing as well. That was on the slide? No difference? What's frustrating though, Ethan, is if you got a system of several sow herds, one could have a problem with prolapsing and the others are not. Fed the same feed, same rations. So there's, there's some things that we need to really understand better. So it's climbing that mountain. We're taking one step at a time. I think this, both presentations tonight have value to share with the industry and that's how we get people thinking and hopefully we can make a difference. Question? I guess that's it. Nobody else has any more questions. Thank you. Okay. Be great. She is a pre vet. Are you? No. Very good. Like you too. Kristen. Kristen? Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Okay. Very good.